Hi everybody and welcome to week three of English 1111. This is Mary again and this is a big week because you are working on the rough draft. So I, I know it's a stressful kind of thing and it feels fast. It feels fast to me. So hang in there. It's an accelerated five-week class and we just have to hammer out this rough draft, turn it around, read someone else's and get that final one done and you're done with the class. So, um, but hang in there because I know it's a little stressful. So today I wanted to emphasize a few things that are discussed in the craft of research. And it's on my Kindle. So I'm looking at chapters seven and nine, which were last week's reading, but you're going to be using these concepts and skills as you craft your rough drafts. I want to talk a little bit about them. Uh, two things I want to emphasize from chapter seven, building a complex argument out of a simple one and the other quick tip, falling back on what you know. So complex argument out of a simple one. You might have noticed this in the discussion boards on creating a thesis statement and finding a topic, that your um, problem or your question that you're interrogating should be complex. It shouldn't be something simple like a presentation of information or arguing something that nobody is going to disagree with. Uh, for example, um, it's imperative that we have clean drinking water. I think everybody's going to be in that camp. So how do you take something, for example, like a no-brainer, it's imperative that we have clean drinking water, and make that into something more complex? My simple trick to that is you take your simple idea and add things to it. Add one or two things to that main base. Because it's a good main base. It's imperative that we have clean drinking water. Yes, that is an argument. It's going to be provable, researchable. It's got a good start, but it's just not interesting. It's not controversial. It's not worthy of a paper, really. So, but if you add on, it's imperative that we have clean drinking water. However, current government spending shows a shift away from investment in municipal drinking water. Now all of a sudden there's something more interesting. Well, it's important that we have drinking water, but we're spending not enough money on that. And so then the paper is going to argue that we need to first see this problem, the lack of funds, and then fix it. So just adding that sentence created a viable research paper. You can go in a whole different direction if you take it's imperative that we have clean drinking water, but for most women in the southern world, searching for clean drinking water is a seven to eight hour a day occupation or something like that. I don't know the exact facts, but I data evidence, but I do know that many women in developing parts of the world, which are now referred to as southern, the southern part of the world, spend a lot of their time looking for and carrying drinking water, and there's a lot of illnesses because of lack of clean water. So I, you add something like that onto the imperative for clean water, and it becomes much more complex. Or you could say it's imperative that we have clean drinking water history laden with diseases and despair shows us the consequences of uh, germ laden or infested drinking water. And then that paper can look through history. So often to get a more complex idea, all you need to do is add something. So the base could be good, it just needs something more. Uh, and so this is another way of saying, I don't want people to toss out ideas in future classes or this class just because it's simple, it might be a start. So the other thing is falling back on personal experience. Do not rely on personal experience as evidence in your paper. Do not use personal experience in your paper. You don't even need to use the word I in your paper. This is a research paper, a piece of scholarly writing about something outside of and other than you. Now, why can't you use personal experience? 
I'll give you an example of this. So there's a great art essay called um, The Authority of I, I think, or The Authority of Personal Experience by Joan Scott. And in it, Scott, who's an historian, argues that our personal experience is not sound evidence for an analytic, argumentative, or academic paper. And I'll give you an example. Um, so, for example, I am a cancer survivor. I had a very rare cancer in 2003 called carcinoid cancer. I have the personal experience of having carcinoid cancer, but I am not an expert on carcinoid cancer. I can't tell you its etiology, I can't tell you its origins, I can't tell you how many research dollars are going into it, I can't look at the cancer under a test tube in molecular biology and know what I'm saying. I'm not an expert at all in this cancer. I sure am an authority or expert in my own emotional experience and journey, but that emotional experience and journey really has nothing to do with an intellectual or scholarly analysis of carcinoid cancer. So you can have an experience, I mean even a very dramatic painful experience like cancer or being sexually assaulted, having a baby, being mugged, I mean big things, right? And these are huge things and it's not to discount your experience, but my personal experience of giving birth um, or your experience of getting mugged or getting into a fist fight, whatever it might be, is pretty irrelevant to an analysis of a larger issue, perhaps only to be used as an example to demonstrate a larger point. And so you could use your personal experience as an example to demonstrate a larger point, but why bother? I would leave it out entirely. I really strongly recommend leaving it out entirely. So, um, so that's, those are the highlights for me from chapter seven. And, you know, what I wanted to say about chapter nine is to really ignore the whole thing about warrants. Don't go back and look at that. I find it confusing. Um, and I think the discussion about research not being the evidence itself, but being a vehicle for the evidence, that's kind of a little confusing too. I mean, what, what the book is trying to say in that chapter is that you need to build your paper using evidence, source material, facts, data, um, exactly what the outline did today in D12. There's an outline that says have two quotations here, have some data there. All the way along, you're weaving these facts from credible academic sources into your paper to prove your point. So if I'm going to argue that, um, oh, let's see, let me pick something new. If I'm going to argue that it's really, I'm going to say to my 11-year-old, it's really important that you spend some time outside. And then he might ask me why. And I can say, according to this Journal of Public Health, um, in a study in 2011, it was shown that children who spent one or more hours outdoors had fewer illnesses and did better in school. That's why it's important. Um, not that my 11-year-old is really going to care about that, but um, I have a lot more authority and credibility if I can tell him why it's important that he's outside rather than just say it universally. And so for all your important points, all your main assertions, you want to just keep building that evidence in. Final thing, and I think I touched upon this, but I want to emphasize it again, death to Wikipedia, do not use Wikipedia, and please don't use like the Mayo Clinic newsletter or the U of M newsletter or anything like, uh, I think they're called territory, tertiary sources in uh, the craft of research. You don't want to use, um, if you're going to write about a certain study, a research study, say a study, a public health study of positive outcomes for alcoholism treatment. You don't want to read the news blurb, you know, from the AP Associated Press or from Harvard Newsroom saying, oh, a recent study showed that cognitive behavioral therapy is a better method of treating alcoholism than AA. This is really important. 
That's not the source you include in your paper. You might see that and you're like, wow, that's perfect. Then you go to the actual study itself and you read the study and that is the source that appears in your paper. So rely first on academic sources, scholarly articles themselves, and not on the material or the vehicles that report the scholarly knowledge. So I think that's it for week three. Good luck. Hang in there and hopefully have a little bit of fun. I hope that you're writing about something that you care about. Okay, that's it for today.